On now. There you go. Okay. All right. We'll start over. Good morning. Welcome, committee. We're going to have an informational hearing on Senate Bill 269 uh, for the committee. And we will start off by um, almost all of our uh, test people testifying will be on WebEx. So we'll get the virtual on it. And we should have everybody on with the right time. So uh, we will begin with the reviser to give us a review of what the statute re reads. Tamara. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good morning, committee. Uh, Senate Bill 269 would amend various provisions of the act relating to the possession, transportation, and sale of dangerous regulated animals. Section 1 of the bill would expand the current definition of dangerous regulated animal. Current law defines da dangerous regulated animal to include lions, tigers, leopards, jaguars, cheetahs, mountain lions, bears, and all non-native venomous snakes. The bill would also include non-human primates and wolves in that definition of dangerous regulated animal. Current law states that it is unlawful for a person to possess, slaughter, sell, purchase, or otherwise acquire a dangerous regulated animal with certain exceptions. Senate Bill 269 would prohibit the possession, slaughter, sell, purchase, or acquisition of non-human primates and wolves but again, would also allow certain exceptions. Section two would provide an exception for a person who possesses a valid USDA license, is in compliance with the Animal Welfare Act, and has not been convicted of a felony in the past 10 years to breed, purchase, or otherwise acquire a non-human primate or wolf only in order to maintain the operating inventory possessed on July 1 of 2021 uh, the person could also sell non-human primates or wolves to other licensees or compliant facilities, again, for the purpose of maintaining the current operating inventory or sell the non-human primates or wolves outside the state. Senate Bill 269 would also provide the requirements for a person in lawful possession of a non-human primate or wolf prior to July 1, 2021, to continue possession of those animals if the person maintains records that establish their lawful possession. The person does not acquire additional animals except as provided in the act, has not been convicted of an offense involving the abuse or neglect of animals or any felony in the previous 10 years, has not had a license or permit regarding animals revoked or suspended, keeps each non-human primate or wolf in a facility and conditions that comply with state law, has an identification number placed in each animal via microchip and submits an application for registration to the local animal, animal control authority. Senate Bill 269 would also require a person who can no longer care for a dangerous regulated animal to place that animal in a facility that is exempt from the act. That placement would also be required if a court orders the permanent disposition of a dangerous regulated animal. Additionally, the bill would state that except for non-human primates, uh, of the family Lemuridae, I'm totally butchering that, but um, a dangerous regulated animal would not be allowed in proximity to members of the public without sufficient distance or barriers. The bill would also require a person who possesses, possesses a dangerous regulated animal to report a potential exposure to, of a human to rabies or other zoonotic disease to the local animal control or authority within 24 hours. And as I said at the beginning, there are certain exemptions to the act um, and Senate Bill 269 would amend those exemptions. The bill would remove the current uh, existing exemption for the Department of Wildlife, Parks and Tourism. In addition to the exemptions already in current law for certain entities such as zoos, aquariums, wildlife sanctuaries and research facilities, the bill would also explicitly exempt law enforcement and incorporated nonprofit animal protection organizations that are temporarily housing dangerous regulated animals at the request of law enforcement. Additionally, the bill would provide the requirements for an exhibitor to be exempt from certain provisions of the act. Um, and the bill would also provide the requirements for a person who is temporarily transporting a dangerous uh, regulated animal through the state, including the notice, caging, and time requirements. The bill includes a number of technical amendments to sort of uh, clean up the language in the act. The bill will take effect on July 1, 2021, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. All right, uh, thank you very much, Tamara, for a good report there. Uh, any questions for the reviser at this point? Seeing none, thank you very much. We will begin with our uh, first proponent, 
and uh, virtual. All of our uh, t people testifying virtual today. Uh, we'll begin with Midge Grinstad from the Humane Society of the United States and those other organizations. On your agenda, those have provided written testimony too for your information. Midge, are you there? Hello, Midge. I did unmute, so sorry. <laughs> it's technical, okay. on, it's hard to do. <laughs> okay, uh, good morning, Senator Kirshen and members of the committee, and thank you for allowing me to give testify this morning regarding the Dangerous Regulated Animal Act in Kansas. My name's Midge Grinstead. I'm the Kansas State Director for the Humane Society of the United States. On behalf of our members and advocates in Kansas, we support Senate Bill 269. Uh, currently in the United States, there are 27 states that prohibit um, private ownership of primates and another 11 that require permits or regulations. Uh, there are 28 states that ban wolves and another 11 that have permitting or other requirements. In Kansas, we have 12 counties, 41 cities that have bans on wolves and primates. However, the animals don't know boundaries, and you're going to hear from some others today about why that's important. Uh, Senate Bill 269, as described by the reviser, does ban private ownership of wolves and primates in Kansas. Um, it exempts the uh, accredited AZA zoos, ZAA zoos, wildlife sanctuaries, research facilities, and the USDA licensed facilities and circuses. Uh, individuals who are currently possessing um, wildlife, uh, the non-human primates or wolves, will not lose their animals. They simply will not be allowed to get more when those pass on. Um, animal health professionals across the United States agree that these are not pets. They shouldn't be kept as pets, regardless of their training. It, they're inherently dangerous wild animals. In particular, primates can carry uh, and spread viral, bacterial, fungal, and parasitical diseases that uh, can affect humans, including herpes B virus, which can be fatal. Wild animals retain their basic instincts, even when they're captive and hand raised. I, I think uh, individual people who don't, um, who raise them from a baby and think they're so cute, don't understand how long it takes them to mature and what happens to the animal when it does mature. Uh, they can cause serious injuries. Um, they just, people who have these animals don't understand. They don't have the knowledge or experience or resources to safely house and meet the specialized needs of the non-human primates and wolves. As a result, it puts our communities and people at risk. In particular, emergency responders, um, paramedics, fire department, think of a fire and somebody going in and, and there's primates there. Um, I've heard stories of animal control officers uh, going into places uh, to get a dog or another animal out and there's a primate there or the dogs or wolves. Um, and they go in with no PPE, protective personal equipment. They have literally no training. Law enforcement has no training. Uh, there's no place to put the animals. And the bottom line is the money expended uh, to remove them after there's a, a bite or an attack or they get loose or during flooding and tornadoes and all those other things we have in Kansas. The bottom line is the money is incredible that you have to expend to have professionals remove these animals so no one gets hurt. Uh, you're going to hear from Sheriff Lori today about the cost associated with removing animals from his county. And so I, I hope you all will support this bill. I think it's a good common sense legislation that works proactively to protect our communities and the people in Kansas. I would uh, draw your attention to, I have an attached sheet to my testimony. Uh, some of the groups couldn't be here today, in particular the AZA accredited zoos. We have seven in Kansas and they are supporting this bill as is the Sheriff's Association who is responsible for um, regulating the act. I'd be happy to answer questions uh, at the correct time. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Midge. Uh, committee, any questions for Midge this time? 
Seeing none, we will move on to our next opponent, Sheriff Jack Lorry from Atchison County. Jack, are you there? Yes, Senator, thank you very much. Welcome to the committee. Yes, thank you and, and the committee for allowing me to speak today. Um, are you able to hear me okay? We're, we do, okay. go ahead. Um, in 2013, um, uh, in my first three months of taking office as sheriff, uh, I was faced with a pretty dangerous situation where one of our citizens had uh, essentially abandoned uh, some wild some wild animals, including uh, well, ranging from skunks and bobcats, lynx, uh, servals, uh, a couple mountain lions, and a fully grown tiger, and we were um, forced to uh, seize these animals uh, due to the conditions and to the uh, danger that they were posing to our community. Unfortunately, they didn't teach us this in the police academy uh, of of how to to uh, seize a tiger or uh, or any of these these animals. And and as the sheriff, being the uh, animal control officer of the county. Uh, it, it was my obligation to make sure that our community uh, stayed safe um, with these animals being in the, these types of cages that they that were constructed. These cages were constructed with, uh, they were just chain link fences leaned up against each other, secured with hose clamps and some wire and uh, very, very unsecure. About 150 yards from the roadway, a daycare was a few hundred yards away and here we are uh, with, with a 400 pound tiger and, and two mountain lions um, that we had no clue of how to care for or, or even to try to uh, seize. But we fed these animals for, for months um, and we had no money to pay for this food. Uh, fortunately, the Kansas City Zoo was able to provide us with, with food to feed these animals for a few months until we were able to make, um, to, to acquire the resources necessary to uh, transport these animals out of out of the county safely in, in a safe manner, which I can't testify to uh, what all that entails as far as permits and, and uh, licensing to do so. But um, the cost of this would have been well over $40,000, which is not in the sheriff's budget in Atchison County. And, Fortunately, we were able to have private companies uh, fund this for us, um, but it took a lot of a lot of work and a lot of assistance by Ms. Grinstead and, and others to to make this happen. But um, this isn't something that any sheriff or law enforcement officer can can prepare for. And in fact, putting my deputies in a situation up close and personal situation with uh, a tiger, a 400 pound tiger and, and mountain lions to feed them on a on a regular basis was a uh, uh, not something I want to ever have to do again. So I would like to, um, I would appreciate the, the consideration of, of Senate Bill 269. And um, so no no other law enforcement has to deal with this situation in the future. Any questions for Jack? Where did the, where did the animals end, eventually end up at? The, moved? the tiger was, was relocated to Texas, uh, I can't necessarily remember the name uh, of the facility at this point. And then the the, the cougars were also uh, located to another place in Texas. Uh, the bobcats were taken to to uh, Florida, and the skunks and a few others were taken to different locations in Kansas, I believe. Okay. Any other questions for Jack? Seeing none, thank you very much for being here today. Appreciate Thanks, your testimony. Uh, next, we have uh, uh, Brandon Sokol, Animal Control Officer for Ma Manhattan, Kansas. Brandon, you there? Yes, uh, sir. Are you there? You Welcome to the committee. Yes, go right ahead. All right. Thank you for hearing me speak today. Um, back in 2006, my township had an issue with a gentleman who was breeding um, wolves um, to make wolf hybrids where he was then selling. Though I wasn't here at that time, I did work with two animal control officers who were 
present during that um, event. And it sounds like this guy had quite the operation that he had to move to several counties. So he was in our area. He would move from Riley County to Wabunsa County to Pottawatomie County to evade um, local law enforcement intervening with his operation. Um, I think they tried to get him shut down for several years until eventually the state did step in um, and then seize the animals. Now, when they finally did this, he was at a place that was, you know, very close to the city of Manhattan and not far from a middle school. So when law enforcement actually showed up to seize these animals, they found that many of them were not in good health. Um, much of them, you know, their temperaments had degraded to, you know, that of a feral animal or something that was much more wild than a pet. And, you know, I believe there was over 40 animals there and they euthanized most of them, um, though they did have some escape. So most of them that escaped were captured. Um, but one of them, one of these wolf um, or wolf hybrids ended up running wild through town um, for about a week. Uh, there were several instances where the animal was seen by people um, or encountered by people. And that could be a very unsafe situation a lot of times people you know could see this animal and think maybe it's someone's pet so then they would try to approach it which would put them in a very dangerous situation um, it eventually got to a point where they were able to dart the animal and then chased it again through town um, this was actually in pretty close proximity to the high school um, and during the event they actually uh, shut the high school down and advised that everybody stay inside um, once they did get the animal sedated uh, they euthanized it on this on the spot um what's really interesting about that case is you know they didn't they weren't prepared to handle the animals and you know once they escaped there wasn't really any training for how to get that animal secured safely um you know darting the animal is only slightly safer than using um, like a lethal firearm which they eventually had to do um my township recently has also experienced uh, alligators that were either set loose or escaped from a pet store after that store was vandalized again the owners didn't really have this you know they weren't in a secure area um or you know really prepared for the animals to have escaped so once they were loose they had no way of getting the animals caught we had no way of really catching the animals or handling the animals and uh, our managers actually asked us not to be involved so then what we ended up having was members of the community and these pet store owners scrambling to try and catch these animals, um, which, you know, we tried to encourage people not to get in the creek where the animals were, but that, you know, ended up not, you know, nobody really was taking that advice, or at least people were, but you'd have people that were going in. I think one of the animals uh, was actually captured by a construction worker who was just on break and saw the animal. Um, but again, you know, once they were loose, no one knew how to handle them. I'm pretty, I'm prepared to handle dogs, cats, you know, other companion animals, um, guinea pigs, rats, even birds and aquariums. I, I feel I'm very um, trained to handle those and, and could address that situation, come up with a, a solid plan right away. Experiencing something like a primate, I mean, that would be something I don't have the experience for um, or, you know, PPE or tools to do. I'd have to defer to somebody like, you know, law enforcement to have a a firearm or try and get someone from a zoo i think you know ideally if you had a owner who was cooperating and able to get the animal secure that's ideal um otherwise yeah we're going to trying to dart the animal um or using lethal methods that's all for me okay <laughs> okay thank you very much brandon any questions from the committee for brandon so brandon when when you made this call, so who comes out when you say law enforcement shows up? Who is that? The local ones, or is there somebody in the state that yeah, does that? Excuse me. So uh, Raleigh County PD would would assist me in a situation like that, um, or at least that would be my first step to try and contact um, if I needed something um, like a firearm or even darting the animal. Okay. Any other questions, uh, Senator Fag? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as far as uh, I noticed, the liability insurance is two hundred fifty thousand. Uh, I find that kind of, in some cases, probably pretty low. You know, if something bad happens, the people that actually buy these animals are they for pets? Or are they buying and selling to make money? What's what are they doing with these animals? What was the guy doing with the animals that you had? Yeah, he was. Um, 
breeding them to make money. Absolutely. And, you know, really, it seems like the type of people that are into these animals or at least to breeding and selling them, um, I would consider, in lack of better terms, odd um, and usually lacking the mental capacity to really handle these animals or, you know, um, understand the scope of responsibility in keeping them. Okay. Okay. Thank you again, Brandon. Next up, Thank we'll you. have uh, Amber. Uh, stay tuned. We might have some questions later on just in case somebody has some extra questions. Uh, Amber Bol Bolby, President of Kansas Animal Control Association. Amber, can you hear us? Hey, Ann, can you hear me? We got you. All right. So welcome to the committee. Thank you. Good morning. Um, my name is Amber Bolby. I am the current president of the Kansas Animal Control Association, and I am here to testify in support of SB 269. The uh, changes within this bill are necessary to help prevent the private ownership of currently unregulated dangerous animals, um, specifically primate, non-human primates and wolves. I am a former zoo employee. I'm a former animal control employee, and I currently work in law enforcement. I can attest that there is absolutely no logical reason why a private citizen should own one of these animals. And beyond the obvious physical dangers of such aggressive animals, there are a myriad of zoonotic diseases these animals carry. Um, I think Mitch touched on some of them. Um, rabies, tuberculosis, Ebola. Uh, we're quite literally in the middle of a pandemic because of a zoonotic disease. And quite honestly, a country's um, lack of regulation. So that needs to be taken into consideration. Um, I can also assure you that no police department, sheriff's office, health department, or animal control agency is equipped to deal with such animals. And um, Sheriff Jack Lori, you know, testified that he wasn't trained at the academy to deal with these kind of animals. They don't. Um, and when a jurisdiction is too small to employ animal control, it's the police officers that have to go out and take take these calls and handle these animals. Um, and that also places them in unnecessary danger. Many cities, including my own, do not have ordinances against such animals. So we have to rely on the state statutes and regulations. Unfortunately, in the wake of the popular docuseries on Netflix, Tiger King, the ownership of exotic and dangerous animals is more appealing than ever. So this is why we need to be proactive rather than reactive in passing this bill. Uh, I really appreciate your guys' time and consideration in this matter, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much, Amber. Any questions that anybody has for Amber? Senator Alley. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I had a neighbor that uh, had the kangaroos and the small ones. I can't remember what they called those. Are those classified as exotic animals? They are not native to the United States, so yes. Okay, thank you. So that's the definition of exotic animal is not native to the United States? Not, not native to your locale. So if something... Um, like an alligator, they are native to Florida, but they're not native to Kansas, so they would be considered exotic in Kansas. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I have a question. Uh, why isn't the alligator on that list? Dangerous animal. Is that a possibility, or because they there's there's more of them around? People have found, found that have been released whatsoever. Is that a? They're not on the list, obviously, but is, is that a potential candidate? Most definitely. Um, I think Brandon talked about having dealt with alligators. I dealt with alligators in my um, prior jurisdiction. In fact, my neighbor has a pet alligator. So when it gets too big, I, I don't know what he plans on doing with it, but um, it definitely could be added to the list. Any other questions? So, you know, thank you very much. Amber, appreciate your being here. Uh, next, we move to Nika Orbaugh from the Kansas Animal Control Association. Nika, can you hear us? Yes, sir, and thank you for having me today. Um, Welcome to the committee. Thank you. I, I would speak to alligators and crocodiles very quickly. Here in Sedgwick County, we generally pull one dead one a year, um, either out of Lake Afton um, or the area waterways. 
uh, they are sold within Sedgwick County, not in the unincorporated county. They're sold in Derby, Kansas um, at one particular shop. Uh, people get them when they're little and cute and fit in 50 gallon aquariums. And then when they get to be not so little and cute, uh, they really just don't have the ability to hold on to them anymore. So they either turn them loose thinking they're going to be okay and they die because they're not equipped to handle our winters at all. And if we're really, really lucky, they don't take any kids toes with them before they go. Um, and it's just not fair to the animal in any aspect. I know they're cute and fuzzy, but that's not the right way to handle your situation. So I know I personally wouldn't be opposed to adding them to the bill. Uh, more than anything, though, I'd like to spend my time talking about wolves because that is the biggest problem that we have when it comes to exotics in Sedgwick County. I'm here representing the Kansas Animal Control Association, but I also work as the supervisor for animal control for Sedgwick County. In the past year alone, we have dealt with two wolves um, and several wolf hybrids. Um, the personal one the one that's closest to my heart is the one that came into the wichita animal shelter weighing 78 pounds he was approximately 50 pounds underweight um he now weighs 130 pounds and lives at a preserve in new mexico called wanagi wolf rescue um he's been renamed wape if anybody wants to google him after the meeting uh, he stayed with us for about five months uh, we built an enclosure just for him um, we housed him outside of the shelter because while he was at the shelter, he bit two people over food guarding behaviors um, that they didn't realize were food guarding behaviors because wolves behave very differently than dogs. And they look just close enough to dogs to be so incredibly dangerous. It, it, seeing it in reality just blows my mind every time because they look like they should be friendly until you get close. And then those behaviors go so much faster than they do with dogs. Um, he ate over the course of the few months he was with us approximately $2,000 in chicken. Uh, we didn't have the budget to buy that. That came out of my pocket. Um, I went with my credit card every week and bought seven whole chickens. Part of the reason he was so incredibly underweight is they were trying to feed him just plain old Purina dog chow where he was. And wolves can't subsist on dog food because they're not dogs. And I think that's one of the things we try to drill into people's heads so much. These are wild animals. They start out being a cute, neat, exotic pet that you can show your friends as a puppy and they grow up needing to cover miles and miles to get their drive out and to get their energy out and they need raw meat and supplemented with plants and vegetables to survive they are not dogs um before he left for new mexico we were out about another three thousand dollars at the vet to get him in compliance for usda transport um that pin we were very 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 fortunate to get uh, several portions of it donated, and we only had to spend about $300 on the pen. Um, when we were done, I cannot even come close to what the sheriff had been through. But when we were done, we were out about $5,000 on one animal um, to get him out alive. He was a really cool wolf. He was, um, you could interact with him to a certain extent. However, we kept interactions very minimal. We kept him to one caretaker. So we limited that liability and that person volunteered for the job to get him out of the county. Um, we do have regulations banning wolves and wolf hybrids here. It doesn't help when counties on all sides of you don't. Um, we get them in from Riley County. We get them in from Coffee County and particularly around Lebo. Um, we get them in from all over the place, people buying them as pets and just not knowing any better until they get big and uncontrollable. Uh, one of the strangest interactions I've ever had with my son, which is saying a lot because he's a teenager, is him sending me a Snapchat in the middle of the night from Riverside Park in the heart of Wichita, Kansas, and saying, Mom, you need to get down here. There's a wolf in Riverside Park. And I was very bleary eyed and it was 2 a.m. And I thought, there's not a wolf in Riverside Park. Um, 
A few days later, that wolf, thanks to the judicious actions of Wichita Animal Control, which is a separate department, and I have to call them out as being fantastic, was housed at the Wichita Animal Shelter, and they made the breeder of that wolf come back and get it. Uh, the owner actually found he couldn't control it, became afraid of it, tried to transport it, and it broke out of his car. Um, it was a wolf, a full-blooded wolf. Um, very, very briefly, we have had minor interactions with primates in Sedgwick County. In 15 years, I've been very fortunate to never interact with a large primate. I know that hasn't been the case for some of my brother and sister animal control people out in Western Kansas, um, but we have had small primates such as capuchins and marmosets. They are not legal to own inside the city limits of Wichita. Um, unfortunately, in those instances, the animals did end up deceased. Um, they were either left out in the cold in a car when a gentleman went to class at WSU or escaped and died out in the winter. Um, I have a huge heart for animals and whatever you take away from my testimony, um, please know that even though I'm a strong proponent of the bill, I'm a strong proponent of the bill not because I want to see them eradicated, but because I want to see them taken care of. Your average citizen is not equipped to handle apex predators and animals like this. Um, they need to be kept in places where people understand them and can safely house and take care of them. Thank you very much for your time and I can hang out for any questions you might have about my experiences. Hey, thank you very much, Nika, we appreciate that. Does anybody have a question now for Nika at this point? Uh, Senator Fagg. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I don't know if you know the answer to this, but do we have mountain lions in Kansas? I have never personally seen one. However, I have seen very convincing trail cam footage that would indicate we do. I do not know of any private ownership, though, outside of zoos. All right, then. Thank you very much. Uh, um, uh, committee, that's all I have for our proponents. Uh, for this morning. Is there anyone else here that wants to testify as a proponent? Seeing none, we will, I will draw your attention to the written testimony for proponents on your agenda there. That list right there, you can examine that at your leisure. Uh, next up, we have uh, Matt Fouts from Goddard, Kandinika Park. Matt, are you there? I'm here. Okay, welcome to the committee, and uh, we look forward to hearing from you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, committee members. My name is Matt Fouts. I'm the director of Tanganyika Wildlife Park in Goddard, Kansas, which is on the west edge of Wichita in Sedgwick County. We're an accredited zoological facility accredited by the Zoological Association of America, and we're the um, only zoo in Kansas to receive the Humane Certified Certification from American Humane, which is the oldest and most prestigious humane organization in the United States. Um, as far as the amendments to this bill, you know, the original intent of the bill was to ensure the public was safe from dangerous, regular, uh, dangerous animals. So tigers, lions, uh, bears, those kinds of things. Um, and I feel like if the sole intent of the, the amendments that are being proposed were to ensure public safety, they would have defined specifically non-human primates. I, I, wolves makes perfect sense, but non-human primates and would have defined it more as like gorillas, chimpanzees, things that are clearly dangerous, um, just like they, they named tigers and leopards and lions specifically in the bill. They didn't just say all big cats. They didn't just say cats. Uh, they were very specific to the species. And I feel like they would have done the same thing if their intent was to stay kind of germane or stay with the, the intent of the bill, which is to protect the public from dangerous regular animals. As it stands, all non-human primates include something uh, as small as a tamarin, which uh, Nika mentioned, which only weighs nine ounces, or an owl monkey, which weighs 1.3 pounds, or a lemur that's five pounds, right? So uh, th these are animals that are not uh, inherently dangerous uh, and, and, you know, not like a chimpanzee or a gorilla. So uh, I, I believe that the, am the amendments uh, that are proposed are primarily just to uh, help them regulate the pet trade and not necessarily protect the public from dangerous regulated animals. Again, uh, we had testimony talking about how alligators should be on there, and I, you know, I agree with that. I have no problem with that. 
um, but not, you know, there's a definitely a difference between a five pound lemur and a, uh, an alligator, right? So, uh, so, so I don't believe, I, I believe that, you know, primarily th these amendments are, are aimed at pushing their agenda, their extreme ideology in terms of trying to separate the public from contact with animals because then they can have more, they can be more effective in their legislation by stopping breeding at zoos and other uh, legal private institutions, as well as uh, just, like I said, regulating the pet trade, not necessarily just protecting the public. So um, these amendments would also do very little to clean up the regulatory issues that are currently exist in the bill. And they add unnecessary burdens for state authorities, accredited institutions like ourselves, and just the animals themselves. Uh, the most of this is th this bill has already been very effective. Um, there are very few of the big cats left in the state, uh, according to testimony today. And there may be other instances, but there's very few, do very little documentation of of non-human primates being an issue for animal control. Um, and so, I mean, as far as the big cats and stuff go, I, there's obviously some issues with wolves. So I, again, have no problem with those being added, but but by adding all non-human primates, I think that's a problem, one. And then there are still other inconsistencies throughout the bill uh, that, that should be addressed going forward. Uh, I guess kind of long story short, you know, 2019, we reached out to Humane Society of the United States uh, to try and work with them on a, a bipartisan bill, one that we felt would help clean up the current issues in the bill, as well as, you know, add some of the things like wolves and, and other areas to help protect the public. And ultimately, they weren't interested. Any suggestions that we had were not listened to, and they would only promote what they were after. And so, um, you know, we would very much like to be a part of that process to try and help make things better. Um, but, but again, the intent and the language in the bill is, is geared at just promoting their ideology, controlling breeding and, and that kind of stuff and not necessarily trying to protect the public solely. So um, with that, I you know, would be open to any questions. Hey, thank you very much. Uh, committee, any questions for Matt? Seeing none, I have one. Um, do, do people ever come approach your zoo and ask you to take animals? Does that ever happen? Because you're- um, we, we work with, I mean, we've worked with uh, Wichita Animal Control on uh, an alligator and, and various other animals. Um, outside of that, I mean, we haven't been approached very often. Um, we obviously are very well equipped to handle those kinds of things and would be very open to uh, you know, any any law enforcement officer throughout the state in assisting them with those those projects. We obviously have uh, we have a very large collection of cats uh, and, and the facilities necessary, the food necessary to, to help with those things. If that's something that that they would need assistance with, as well as the expertise to catch animals. Um, and so, um, you know, we're very willing and, and, and able to help any local law enforcement officer that that is dealing with this issue. Did you say you had, did they ever call you and ask for help? Um, th there, we've never had to go out and help with an animal. Uh, most of the time, they'd already captured the animal, and then they brought it to us to either house it or um, help find it a home, place it at another facility or whatever. Okay. Uh, here was, uh, Senator Ware. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so you guys currently are doing some breeding there. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. We, I mean, uh, you know, we started as a breeding facility um, and our, our family owned facility here has, uh, I mean, had a dramatic impact on the survival of many different species, specifically cats through our breeding programs. Um, and, and my follow up question is what happens with the offspring? Do you guys, uh, what do you do with, with the offspring? Uh, they primarily go to other uh, facilities. Um, we do participate in several uh, animal management plans or, you know, uh, AZA SSPs, um, different things like that. So a lot of them go to other breeding facilities, or I should say zoos that are, are breeding them, trying to help sustain those populations here in the United States. Um, 
you know, and, and things like that. Is there a profit in it for you when you do that? Um, sometimes we do sell animals. Any other questions for Matt? Uh, Senator Fagg. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I was wondering if you could comment. It, it mentioned wolves in here, but it says excluding any hybrid thereof. Uh, when you say hybrid thereof, you know, first thing comes to mind means coyotes. And do they take the wolves? Is, if there's wolves in Colorado and you got the coyotes around here, and do, the, do those two breed and you see some hybrid coming off of that? Or I mean, I, I, I think wanna... it's, it's probably possible that those two could breed, not very likely. I, I think mostly what they're after there, uh, kind of like Nico was talking about, like where you have an instance where a gentleman is breeding wolves with, uh, you know, a husky or some form of dog. And so it's no longer a pure wolf. It's, it's you know, a half husky, half dog kind of thing. And so. Anybody else? Any questions? Senator Francisco. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. So can you give us some of your specific concerns about the changes um, that are proposed um, in this bill? Are there particular um, changes that you um, have concern with? Well, I mean, for instance, uh, just the, the simple fact that they do carve out lemurs uh, for contact, but but I, I don't see uh, why the, the line was drawn there arbitrarily. And, and primarily, I believe it's because we have a lemur encounter that people do come from all over the country to participate in. And so in their attempt to appease us, they, they carved out lemurs so that our lemur island wouldn't be closed, which would be detrimental to our facility. Uh, but currently, we do an encounter with an owl monkey that, that weighs 1.3 pounds. Uh, it actually came from the Columbus Zoo. That's what uh, it was used in encounters or experiences at the Columbus Zoo with Jack Hanna's crew. And uh, uh, they, they no longer uh, needed it there. So he came here and we've been doing encounters with, with him. But that wouldn't be allowed per this bill. Um, likewise, uh, lemurs are exempted from public contact, but per this bill, they can't be taken out of their primary enclosure. So we do do an experience with a red ruffed lemur like many zoos do around the country. And we, we uh, bring it to a specific room where you have a small meet and greet with that animal that would no longer be allowed in this bill. Um, you know, I have other problems with it in that, like, you know, even if, if we don't allow contact with the cats, as we advocated in the past, uh, I still am not allowed to take them off site to bring them to uh, the news or different things like that so that we can promote the public, talk about them, you know, even talk about how these are not pets and you should not have them, right? But you can visit your local uh, zoo and, and support animals that way. You can learn about them, care about them, and hopefully help raise money to support them, not only in our facilities, but in the wild, right? Um, you know, the zoos, zoos serve an important role in that regard. And uh, contact and, and these kinds of situations are the things that allow us to, to really build that bond so that people will care enough, um, you know, it's, it's not easy to get kids' attention away from a tablet. You got to do something more than just see animals 100 yards off in order to get their attention and to really uh, touch their hearts. Senator Straub. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Do we have, um, maybe this is for Matt, have you presented amendments to fix these issues in the bill? Uh, not, not, not this, not this year. We have in the past, and then uh, we, we actually promote. We had our own version of the amendments. Uh, I think it was 2018. We lost by one vote in the in the Senate, um, and then after that, we we did try to come together, like I said, with HSUS to to find uh, you know a, a bill that we could work together on, so that we're not spending tens of thousands of dollars uh, of money that could be going to help support our animals and successful successful breeding programs. Um, and, and so find something that, that would work for, for both parties. And uh, as, as I mentioned, they, they weren't interested. Okay, and one more question. Um, maybe this is for the chairman. Could we do a field trip? <laughs> I, we've been to your facility many times and really enjoy it. It's, it's, it's a great experience for the kids. So thank you. 
Well, thank you. Yeah, and, and I mean, I, I would love it if all of you would come come visit um, and have um, and see see what we do and how we do it um, and, and how impactful it can be. Um, I think that would be great. Okay, any other questions? Seeing none, thank you very much, Matt, for your testimony. Appreciate that for being here. And, thank you. Uh, and um, committee, we will we'll close the hearing on Senate Bill 269. And uh, with that, we are adjourned. Thank you very much. No meeting tomorrow or Friday. <laughs>